I've been talking to, talking to our pastoral team and talking to my wife. I was like, I cannot wait to preach the message that God has given me for today. I cannot wait to preach it. It's, it's something that I've, I even told the leadership team today, just, I want up to bat. This message right here has changed me. It has really spoke to me and I, I pray and I have prayed over it. I have anointed the words of this message with oil and I've prayed over it that it would be received by you. Hallelujah. Before we go into the word of the Lord, just a couple of announcements. Annual business meeting, February the 21st at 6.30. Men's breakfast, Dan's Diner Saturday uh, at 7.30. And our missions conference in Nashville is March the 20th. Please be saving your pennies to give a good missions offering to our, our evangelists overseas. I do have one major announcement uh, to make before we go into the word of the Lord. Jill Freeman, where are you at? Jill, come here. Let's give Jill a hand. This young lady is not number three, not number one, not number two, but she is numero uno in robotics in Arkansas. She's like the goat. She's the good kind of goat. And uh, we are so very proud of you. That is such a major, major accomplishment. And uh, Brother Jeff went uh, to, to watch her in action. He said, man, she's in charge. She's, she's the one calling all the shots. So we're very proud of you. Let's give Jill another hand. It's good to have smart folks in your church, isn't it? Amen. We don't ask you to check your brain at the door. We want you to be smart. Hallelujah. So, so good to have all of you in the house of the Lord today. If you would turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 17. And this, is, uh, this picks up in Paul's ministry to where he's going from, from a, a nation state to nation state, from city to city evangelizing in the Mediterranean. And our reading is going to begin where he reaches the city of Athens, Greece. And I know that uh, I, some of you may have been to Athens or have been to Greece. I believe, uh, I believe that uh, Greg and Jennifer have been there. No, it was Rome you were telling me about. How many of you have been to Athens? I haven't. It is definitely on my bucket list. If, if God places a desire in your heart to give me some money to go to Athens and Israel, answer that call. Yeah, not Georgia. Yeah. I've been there. Don't want to go there. Yeah. The uh, Acts chapter 17, we'll start our reading at verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly or entirely given to idolatry. And if you don't know what idolatry is, it is the worship of false gods, the worship of dead idols. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and with the, in the market daily with them that met with him. And certain philosophers of, uh, uh, of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and some said uh, what will this babbler say you ever been called a babbler what will this crazy babbler say other some he seemeth to be uh, a setter forth of strange gods because his he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection he preached two things he preached that Jesus is God and that he is risen from the dead and they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou he speakest is. In other words, we want to know something about this new doctrine. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. These are new words. These are strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians... 
and strangers which were spent in their time and, uh, on nothing else. In other words, they, they spent their time on nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. You ever, hear, you ever know one of these people? That all they want to hear is some new thing. That they spend all their time trying to hear a new thing. Well, let me tell you something. I've got no new thing to tell you today. I've got a very old thing to tell you. Something that never changes, I've got to tell you today. The same gospel that Paul preached on that day, I'm going to preach to you on this day. So if you want, if you think that, that Brother Jim has got some magic pixie dust and he's going to tell you some new thing, I'm going to tell you a thing, an old thing in a way that you may have never thought about it. But I'm not going to tell you any new thing today. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by, I beheld devotions. I found an altar to, to the inscription, and this is all caps, to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, I am going to declare him unto you. I'm going to tell you who the unknown God is that you worship ignorantly. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven. This is the, this unknown God that you worship ignorantly. He is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. He needs nothing. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. You may be seated. In Athens, and I would love to go and see the Parthenon and all those great ruins, but you know that's exactly what they are, is they're ruins. They are ruins. They are, they are uh, 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 all of the gods, and they were very polytheistic. That means they had many gods that they worshiped, many gods, little g. And I have recently been asked about dualism. I've recently be a, have been asked by someone uh, that was raised in church that, well, what about, you know, what about could the Muslims be right and we be right? You know, could, could, uh, could another faith, uh, uh, the Taoist or the, you know, the, all, any of the other major religions, could we both be right? Could we both be serving the same God? I'm going to answer that question for you today. If you've had those mind, those thoughts cross through your mind, I'm going to answer that once and for all for you today so that you will leave here with an understanding of who God really is. They had a God for everything. Kabir, Ka, Kabirus, a, a little-known God, he was the patron God of Athens. And he had supposedly been martyred for the Athenians. He had supposedly given his life, given his life's blood for the Athenians, and he was going to return and to set them free. He was going to return sometime in the future and set them free basically from what everybody else needed freedom from at the time was the Roman Empire. But this Kabirus, he, he was... He had given his blood, supposedly, for his people and was going to come back and he was going to save his people. And many times, actually, the Athenians got in trouble with the Roman government because they were worshiping Kabirus more than they were worshiping Caesar, who also thought that he was God. And so, but they, they believed that this God was going to come back and, and receive them unto himself that this God that had died for them was going to save them. Before Paul ever got to Athens, and I want you to think of this, before Paul ever got to Athens, the devil had already set up a statue to the Antichrist. He had already prepared the Athenian version of the Antichrist. This, this God has died for you, and he's coming back, and he's going to save you. Before before Paul ever entered into the city, he had set up Kaburus, another god that was raised up the counterfeit 
Jesus said that I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. But there was another God on Mars Hill, God, little g, called Apollo. The sun God, the light God, where all light was supposedly had come from was the false God, Apollo. And he was, he was called the sun God. They had false deities, Dionysus. Dionysus, anybody know what Dionysus was the god of? The god of wine. Very good. Man, we've got some scholars. I'm so, I am so thankful to be uh, serving with these men, and, and many of you as well. Dionysus was the the god of wine and drunkenness and merrymaking, basically intoxication. Aphrodite, the god of love, sex, beauty, and reproduction. Zeus, the king god, the father god. He was over the sky, he was over the weather, and he was over all justice. He was the judge over all men. So they believed. Do you know anyone that worships Zeus today? You do? You know one? How many of the rest of you know someone who actually worships Zeus or Apollo? Their temples lie in ruin. Their statues lie in ruin in Greece today. Asil. I should be able to say this better. Asiplius, God of doctors and medicine. And we studied that in nursing school. I'm sure Brother Greg studied that in medical school. He was the Greek God of medicine. But the Apostle Paul, whenever he saw that inscription, it caught his attention. And it's a very haunting it's a very haunting inscription in all capitals to the unknown god and i'm going somewhere you don't think i'm going with this today so i want you to put your german shepherd ears on in truth all the inscriptions should have read to an unknown god little g and I'm not saying that the Athenians, that the Greeks did not believe in these gods. They believed in every one of these gods. They believed that if I pray to Zeus, the king god, the sky god, that it's going to rain on my crops. They believed that if I pray to the, the sun god, the sun of all light, then the sun is going to shine upon my crops. The sun is going to shine upon my day. If I, if I pray to, the, to uh, Aphrodite, I will have many children and, and I, will have, I will have love and beauty in my life. If I pray to these different false deities that they believed in them. Let me tell you something. I want to tell you something that's going to shock you. They believed in these deities as much as many Christians believe in Jesus. Every one of them, even more, some of them, every one of those statues should have said it, had an inscription, though, that said the unknown God. And you say, well, how's that? They believed in them. They believed in them, but they didn't know them. They did not, there was not one person that ever had a conversation with Zeus. There's not one person that ever had a prayer answered by Apollo. There's not one person that ever had a relationship with any of these deities because they were false. They were fake. They didn't exist only in the form of stone statues and inscriptions. So no one ever knew these false gods. The, uh, 
I want to proclaim something to you today. That there is a God. Paul was teaching them in Athens, Greece, what I'm going to teach to you this morning. There is a God that you can not only just believe in, there's a God that you can know. There's a God that you can talk to and he'll talk back. If you'll shut up long enough, he'll talk back. He's not going to try to talk over you. I taught this that this past week at the other side. I was like, you know, one, one actually I wasn't teaching it. Uh, one, of the, one of the men there said, you know, I pray over the same things over and over and over. And, you know, God's already answered them. I don't even know why I'm praying about them. And I said, well, why don't you shut up? I said, when you pray... Go in and acknowledge who God is. Acknowledge that he has all the power in heaven and earth. And thank him for everything he's already done for you. And, and then shut up. I said, because he knows what you need even before you do. He knows you better. He knows the answer to your question before you ever have sense enough to ask it. And he is a God that loves you. He is a real God, the only true God, and he loves you more than you will ever understand that he loves you. He loves you, and I taught about that Wednesday night, just how much God loves each and every one of his children. He is not a myth. He is not a legend. He is not many. He's not even two or three. He is one. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. If you could flip to that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6 said, One Lord, or I'll start at verse 5. It says, actually, we're just going to start at, the, at uh, 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 verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body. Can you say one body? Who is that body? The church is one body. There is one spirit. And what is that spirit called? The Holy Ghost. Come on, Pentecostals. What is that spirit called? Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Woo! How many gods are there? I only need one because he's got all the power. He has all of the authority except over me. And I am going to choose to give him authority in every aspect of my life. And as long as I give him authority, things are going to go well for me. Things are going to go well for you because he knows better than me. Isaiah chapter 44, in verse 6, preach with me for a second. That's what I'm talking about. Isaiah chapter 44, in verse 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me, And this is in the Old Testament, okay? This is the Old Testament, the Father God talking. And beside me, there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and the things that shall come, let them show unto them, for ye... For ye not neither be afraid, have not I told you from the time that I have declared it, ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Question mark. What's the answer to that question? There is no God beside me. Yes, there is no God. Can you say with me, no God? Not any. 
There's not one, there's not two, there's not three, there's not a whole grove of them. There is but one God. He said, and there is not any. He said, is there any God beside me? There is none. I am the first, I am the last, and there ain't nobody beside me. Now let's turn to the New Testament, Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. And Jesus is speaking here. This is actually, uh, this, let's go to verse 12. Jesus is speaking. This is written in red. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as to his work shall be. Now, I want you to stop right there. Well, I didn't think what I did was important. Well, Jesus is speaking in Revelation, and he said, I'm going to return to you whatever your work has been. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. The name of God, the name of the Alpha and the Omega, the only true God, and there is only but one God, and He is alone. There is no other God beside Him. No other God are we to worship. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He is the God King. Now I want you to stick with me here for a second. He is the God King. He is the God. He is the Father God. He is the Son God. He is the light of the world. He is the light of all the world. Not Zeus and not Apollo, but Jesus. He is the God of love and beauty and of reproduction. And God protect our children from the abortion mills in this world. He is the sky God who came down from heaven and he dwelt among us. And he gave himself for us on a cross. He bled every drop of his blood out of his body. And let me tell you something, unlike that other God that I can't hardly pronounce, He is coming back, and he is going to save his people. You know what? He's even the one, he's the God of intoxication. He's got a whole new bottle of wine. He's got a bottle of new wine that he wants to pour every one of us completely full of and intoxicate you, make you happy, make you high, make you feel like you've never felt before. How many of you have ever felt that new wine? Amen. He's the God of intoxication, and yes, he is the God of all healing. He is the only one that can heal you. He is the great physician. And I believe in medicine. I believe that every good medicine came from God. And I believe that God uses doctors and nurses and surgeons and all types of medical professionals. I believe that I've been one. Many of you are. I do believe that. But there is a great physician. And every, the body can't heal itself. It has to depend on that healing power. And let me tell you, there's only one God that whenever he descends on you with healing in his wings, he can work miracles in your life. He has worked miracle after miracle after miracle in my life. The Greeks believed in their gods as as much as many of you believe in Jesus. They couldn't know him. question that I've got for you today is Jesus the unknown God in your life you might know his name you might know the story you might know the scripture In biblical terms, the word no indicates intimacy. Whenever you're talking in biblical terms, to know 
is an intimate thing. I know people that know about Jesus here. They don't know about Jesus here. I know people that don't know a whole lot about Jesus yet here that, that have just love and believe like children. And you know what? God loves that. Do you know him in the way that he wants to know you? Do you really know him? Do you really know him in the fullness of his love? Do you talk to him every day? Do you wake up and talk to him every day? Do you meditate on his words every day? Whenever, whenever you have an opportunity, do you just want to just embrace him and let him embrace you? I don't know how many of you have ever felt the embrace of Jesus, but I've felt it many times to where I can just feel his arms no matter what's going on in my life. I know what, the, what God feels like. No matter what turmoil, no matter what chaos is going all around me, whenever I can just stop and slow down long enough and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy, have mercy, he will wrap his arms around you. And it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're important or not. It doesn't matter if you're intelligent or very simple. He will wrap his arms around you. He is no respecter. Our God, the one true God, is no respecter of persons. And, that, and it means it don't matter who you are. He loves you the same. He loves you more than we love our own children. And you know what? He wants to get to know you. The first time my wife ever walked into the room that I ever laid eyes on her, had one thing on my mind, I want to get to know her. <laughs> I told a buddy of mine, I'm going to marry that girl, first time I ever met her. But that was on my mind, I'm going to, I, I'm going to do everything I can. And she snubbed me when I introduced myself, <laughs> big time. <laughs> but you know, sometimes a relationship takes some work on our part, right? She's wearing the ring I bought her because of my persistence in our relationship. The secret is, is that Jesus wants to get to know you in that same way. He wants to become very close to you. And he is not far from any of us. He's not far away. He's as close as the mention of his name. But if you believe in God, if you believe that Jesus is God, but you don't really know him, I'd like to, like to ask you today, if we have musicians, I know that Sister Crystal had to step out. They had to, they had to leave today. But if I've got musicians, I would like to ask you to come. And there's no shame in this. But you, if you only believe, but you don't know him, but you don't really know him, even the demons, even the devils believe, and they tremble. So he wants to hold you in his arms. He wants to heal your hurts. He wants to rain down his blessings on every aspect of your life. There's, there, there is no part of your life, and, and I don't want to, I want to, don't want to get explicit here, but there's no part of your life that Jesus doesn't want to touch. There's no part of your life whether it be your finances, whether it be your relationships, whether it be your job, he knows the number of hairs on your head, but he's just waiting for you to come to him. And there's not one part of you that he doesn't want to lay his hands on. There's not one part of you that he doesn't want to heal. Please stand with me. 
In Athens, Greece, they had a God for everything. And I want to tell you who the God of everything and the God for everything is. You don't have to go to this God or that God. You don't have to go any farther than these altars. These altars were built. These are altars to the one true God, the God that some of you believe in but you don't really know. I'd like to ask you, if you want a closer walk with Jesus, and you know, I believe in God, I, but I, re- I, don't, I do know God, but I am seeking a deeper walk with Him than I've ever had in my life. If you want a closer walk with Jesus, and the old song says, just a closer walk with Him. I want to be closer to Him, the one who loves me the most. I want to be closer to him than I've ever been. The angels, they know him, they adore him. The devils, they believe and they tremble. I choose to know, to love, and adore the only one true God, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Just a quick question. And these altars should be full. How much different would your life be if you truly knew him? If you truly allowed him to touch you? If you truly exposed every aspect of your life to him? If there was nothing hidden from him? If there was nothing that you were holding back and saying, God, you can have this and you can have that, but oh, don't don't touch that. How much different would your life be? If you were truly withholding nothing, if you were giving yourself to him as his bride, as his church, the bride of Christ. The haunting inscription, the God that nobody knows, the unknown God, to the unknown God. Let me tell you something. A lot of people believe that, you know, on judgment day, all Christians are going to be saved, that all Christians are going to going to walk right in the the pearly gates. Let me tell you something. There's two types of Christians. There's two types of Christians. There's one that he will say, whenever you walk up to the judgment, he's going to say, well done, thou good and thou faithful servant. Now enter in. And there's another type of Christian who will do great works, who will do great miracles by his name. And he's going to say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I wanted to know you, but I never really knew you. I knew the number of hairs on your head. Yes, I knew everything about you, but we never had an intimate relationship. Depart from me. We got to do more, church, than believe. We've got to become intimate with Jesus. I want to know him. I know God. I don't believe in God. I know him. But I want to know him in a deeper way, in a greater way, in a more personal way than I've ever known him. Again, I'm gonna ask you to these altars and as I come to the altar myself, these altars that are dedicated to the unknown God, I wanna get to know him a little bit better. I'd invite you to come with me. Mercies never fail me in darkest night. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head.